Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let me adjust this just a little bit. So happy and glad to have you joining us today. We're so excited about what God is doing. Amen. So we're going to get right into the word today. And as you do so, we just want to welcome everyone who's joining us. We want you to go ahead and make sure you share this broadcast. Let everybody know that um, we're here. Share it on your timeline. Do it as a watch party. Amen. And feel free to comment as you go and as we minister. Today is what we call Pentecost Sunday. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, how can you have a Pentecostal service online? Well, I was kind of praying about that and kind of thinking about that. And I believe I know how we can do it. Amen. Because we're going to talk not about the experience of the Holy Spirit, which is what a lot of people like to talk about. We love, especially us as Charismatics, Pentecostals, or however you want to label us, we love to talk about experiences, but I'm, if you know, if you've been around me long enough, you know that you need to have some substance behind the experience. Amen. And so that's what we're going to kind of get in, get into today. We're going to talk about the substance and about the person of the Holy Spirit and more importantly about the work that he does in our lives, not just what he can do with us, through us and for us. But what does he do in us, okay? In other words, what happens to us when the Holy Spirit comes, amen? I'm, I'm, I'm about substance. I don't want to hear thoughts and theology necessarily. I don't want to hear hypothesis or anything like that. I want to actually hear, I want, I want the real thing. And you've heard me say this many times. It does me no good to minister to you on a Sunday and not give you anything that you can't use on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. In other words, this, this Bible has to be relevant to us. It has to be practical. It has to be able to be applied in our lives. Amen? So let's get right into the Word this morning. Hallelujah. The book of Acts, chapter 1. And I'm going to go to a very familiar verse of Scripture. And I'm going to kind of break this down. I'm going to actually pretty much stay in this one verse, and I'm going to break this down for us today. And I'm, I believe we're going to look at it maybe in a little bit different way than maybe you've seen it before. Amen? So the book of Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to read beginning at verse 6. Amen? And when they had therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his power. And this is where I want to go today. But you shall receive power. Okay? After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and, to, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And verse 9 says, When he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up in a cloud, received them out of their sight. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for who you are. And Father God, we thank you for the work that you have done in us, that you are doing in us, and that you will continue to do in us. Father, we surrender ourselves to you, Father, that you will minister to us today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Now, I want us to look at a couple of things in this verse of Scripture. Number one, Jesus makes this statement. Okay, he says, but you shall receive, you shall receive, you shall receive. In order to receive, you've got to be someone who is willing to take what someone else is offering you. Let me get that, let me drive that home. Some, some people, we have the idea that God's just going to start making us do what he, what he wants us to do, that he's going to force his will upon us, that he's going to... Basically, he, that he's going to make us get in line with him. And as long as he's not making me do anything, then I'm good. I'm happy. I'm doing okay. It doesn't matter what's going on. Amen? That's not the way the Holy Spirit works. Notice Jesus makes this statement. He says, but you shall receive. 
Okay, in order for me to receive, if someone wants to give me something, it's not just enough for them to want to give it to me. Okay, I have to be, I have to place myself in a position to receive. In other words, I've actually got to place myself in a position of vulnerability, and I've got to p p place myself in a position of surrender. See, in order to receive from God, you've got to be one who is vulnerable to God. In other words, you've got to allow him to invade the various areas of your life. You've got to allow him, to, you, you've got to want him to come, into, in, to come into a particular area. This is why many people can be saved and love the Lord, but they'll sit there and they will die of some disease because they never receive healing in their life because they don't believe God is their healer. They believe that God is their savior. They don't believe he's their, he's their healer. This is why people can stay bound in sin and in, 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 in demonic oppression because they've never recognized God as their deliverer. They, they receive him as Lord and savior, but they don't receive him in, as deliverer. Okay, so we've got to learn something right off the bat here. Okay, we've got to learn to receive from God. And I want to receive everything God has for me, okay? I don't, I don't want to get just this little piece of God here and forget about this little piece over there. I want everything he's got for me. I want to be one who receives. And in order for me to receive, number one, I've got to be vulnerable. I've got to put down these walls that I may have in me, walls that have been walls that may have been spoken upon me, walls of my own misconception, walls of my own tradition, walls of my own religion, walls of my own hang-ups. I've got to put those walls down and I've got to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and work in that particular area of my life. Number two, I've got to put myself in a place of surrender. I've got to throw my hands up spiritually Let's like I'm doing now physically, and I've got to say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Here I am. Change me. Here I am. Do what you will do what you want to do in me. So I've got to bring myself to a place of vulnerability, and I've got to bring myself to a place of surrender. Jesus said, You shall receive. Let me say that again. Jesus said that you shall receive receive. He did not say, I would force this on you. I would not push this on you. He said, I, you shall receive. So I place myself in a place of vulnerability and I place myself in a place of surrender. Now, let me explain the difference between that and the, and the, and the difference between uh, receiving and compel. Okay, that word compel, because we hear Paul says that. Paul says, I, I was, I, I'm compelled to do certain things. That means that God has put something in him and in his flesh. He doesn't want to yield in that particular area, but he realizes that he must yield in that particular area. That's the difference. You see, the struggle comes in our flesh. Our flesh won't let us do what God wants us to do. Paul talks about this in Romans 6, 7, and even part of chapter 8. He says, in my flesh, I want to do one thing, but in my spirit, I want to do something else. And that's where I want to go today with this thing about the Holy Spirit, okay? Number one, watch what Jesus says. But you shall receive power. Now, Let's talk about that. There's two words for the word power in the New Testament. Well, actually, there's probably there's actually three main words, but there's two that I want that I want us to look at today because I want to draw something out and I'm going to hopefully answer a question as to how we can have authority but not have power. The the word that the word used as power here in this verse, okay, is the word Dunamis. Dunamis is the Greek word dunamis. And let me give you the definition in the Greek of that Greek word dunamis. It means ability. Okay? It means ability. It means abundance. How many of y'all want the abundance of God in your life? Amen? It means a mighty deed. It's the same word as the word miracle. Okay? It means power. 
It means strength. It means miracle. It means mighty work. So Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that you shall receive ability. Ha, come on. You shall receive abundance. You shall receive mighty deeds. You shall receive power. You shall receive strength. You shall receive miracles. You shall receive mighty works. When? After the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Okay? Now, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. The book of Matthew, the 28th chapter, I want you to see something else. Matthew chapter 28, and beginning at the 18th verse, the Great Commission. We call this the Great Commission. Okay, Acts chapter 28, and verse 18. I want you to see something that Jesus does here. And we can see the same account, basically, in Mark chapter 16, but I want to go to verse 18. And verse 18 says this, and it says, And Jesus came and spoke unto them and said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Let's hold that thought right there. That word power is not dunamis. That word power is exousia. It's the Greek word exousia. Now watch what happens from verse 18 to verse 19. Jesus said all power in verse 18, all exousia, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world or this age. Okay? Jesus uses the word exousia. That word exousia means to have privilege. Ah, come on. It means to have privilege. <coughs> Excuse me. It means to have capacity. It means to have competency or to be competent in something. It means to have freedom. It means to have the right to do something. Watch this last part of this definition. It means to have jurisdiction. What does jurisdiction mean? Okay, I'll give you an example. When I was with the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, okay, I, when the day that I was sworn in as a, as a deputy, as a member of the Sheriff's Office, guess what happened? I had exousia. I had the authority to enforce every law, every parish ordinance, every state ordinance, everything that was written on the laws of the state of Louisiana. I had the authority to enforce those laws. Ah, uh, but wait a second. I didn't necessarily have the capability or the capacity to enforce those laws yet. I never, I'll tell you a funny story. When I was in the patrol division, we were assigned particular areas, particular sectors that we patrolled, okay? And many times, just what, many times what happened was, was that we would cross over to different areas and, you know, to back up another deputy or something like that. But for the most part, we would stay in our particular area and we were responsible to patrol that particular area, okay, unless we were a backup unit or something. When I went to the detective bureau, all of a sudden, guess what happened? My, uh, my territory, so to speak, expanded. Okay, I'm, not, I'm no longer responsible for one particular area. I'm now responsible for the entire parish, East Bank and West Bank and Grand Isle. Okay, and I never forget the first few times when I would go off to do something, I, I was always one who would let my superior, those over me, I would always kind of keep them informed, let them know what I was doing. And after about the second or third time, my lieutenant came to me and he says, Jason, he says, would you mind explaining to me why it is that every time you want to go to the East Bank of Jefferson Parish, you come and you tell me before you go. And it dawned on me when he said that. The reason that I always let him know I was going to the East Bank was because I wasn't used to going to the East Bank of Jefferson Parish 
in the in the course in the scope and course of my work because I was pretty much confined not, not confined but my area was the West Bank. Okay, so guess what? I had authority to go to the East Bank, but I didn't realize I had the ability. I didn't realize that I had the dunamis to go to the West Bank. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so Jesus here, and isn't it interesting that Jesus here gives them the authority to do something before he actually gives them the ability or the power or the dunamis to do something. Look at that again. I give you exousia. I ha all exousia has been given to me in heaven and in earth. And then in verse 19, when he says what he says, he is transferring that authority to his disciples who, who become the apostles. Amen? Do you see that? Okay. So the first thing that came was the authority and then came the ability. All right. So they were given the right to do the exploits, but they hadn't yet been given the ability to do the exploits. And I believe looking at the scripture today, I'm going to show you why. And this just may reveal in your life and in my life, why is it that we we're supposed to have this authority? Why is it that we're supposed to be able to do these mighty exploits? And sometimes it just don't work for us. That's what I want us to see. Okay. Because you see, if we're going to be Pentecostals, if we're going to celebrate Pentecost, okay, if we're going to say we have authority and we have power, then it's about time for us to stop talking about it and it's time for us to start demonstrating it. Amen. So let's go back to Acts chapter one, verse eight. And I want you to see some things here today. Acts, the first chapter, back to Acts chapter one and verse eight. And Jesus makes this statement, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The first thing that you receive when you receive the Holy Ghost, because you cannot do this in your own strength, you receive the, the power, you receive the ability, the abundance, the mighty deeds, you receive the ability to obey. Oh, that's a nasty word in Christendom today because everybody wants to go off and do their own little thing sometimes, okay? And we, 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 we don't want to be obedient, okay? John chapter 14, verse 15 says what? That if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In other words, Jesus said that if you're going to do what I tell you to do, if you're going to do great things, guess what? If you're going to love me, if you're going, if you're going to follow me, then you're going to obey what it is that I tell you to do. Okay. And I want you to know something that Jesus said this. We know this from the book of Acts chapter five, verse 20. Okay. I'm sorry. Acts chapter 15, verse six, around verse six, that the Bible says that 500 were attending this, this going away meeting, this going away party for Jesus. Okay, there were 500 people there, but only 120 ended up in the upper room. Okay, so that tells me that 320 people didn't obey what Jesus said. Jesus gave a specific commandment. He says, go tarry in Jerusalem and wait for the power that will come upon you. Wait for the Holy Ghost. It didn't happen. 380 didn't make it there. Okay, and I want you to know something that Jesus wants people who are going to obey him, not out of command, okay, but out of a willingness because they love him. Jesus makes the connection between love and obedience, okay? I don't obey Jesus because I have to. I obey him because I love him, because I honor him, because I know who he is. And guess what? It's because I trust him good, well enough to know that he's got my best interest at heart. So the first thing the Holy Spirit gives me power to do is to obey. Okay, he gives me the power to obey him. All right, he gives me the power to obey him. 380 just kind of wandered off. It was about a half a mile's journey from where they saw Jesus ascend. 
unto, to the upper room, the historians tell us. And in the space of a half a mile, 380 people decided they just wasn't going to listen. Okay? They're not going to listen. They're not going to pay any attention. They're, not, they're going to go off and do their own thing. And they're probably still waiting around, expecting, waiting for Pentecost to happen to them. And it never happened. So they had authority to do things, but they never had the ability to do something. Okay? Look at that. See that. Okay? They didn't follow through with what Jesus said. So he said, you shall receive power to do what? To obey. All right? Watch this. You also will receive power, those that, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You shall receive power to be a witness. Let's talk about that word witness, okay? We talk about that word witness a lot because we, most of us understand and we know this from previous Bible studies. That word witness means to be a martyr. It means to be a dead man. It means to be a dead woman. Well, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But what does a witness do, okay? When you go to a trial in a courtroom, a witness is one who brings evidence. They come in and they say something, Okay, and they present evidence that either convicts someone or acquits someone. I want you to know that the first thing that Jesus does, he, one of the things that Jesus does after you receive power to be obedient is that he gives you power to be a witness. Okay, you receive the ability to be a witness. Now, witnesses, like I said, is one who brings evidence to either convict or to acquit. In other words, Jesus gives you something to say, all right? He gives you something to say. Look at with me in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 20. Acts, chapter 5, in the 20th verse. Acts, chapter 5, in verse 20. Acts, chapter 5, in verse 20, says this. Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Understand what has happened here, okay? The, the, Peter and James, Peter and John have what? They've been arrested, okay? They've been, they, 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 they've been locked up because they were doing works, doing the works of God. They were doing things, they were doing the, they were demonstrating, they were doing, I like what John Wimber used to say, they were doing the stuff. And so what happens? They get locked up and they get put in jail, okay? And so they, 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 and they were told by the religious people, y'all need to shut up, y'all need to stop talking. But the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the same Spirit that Jesus told them, if you go wait in the upper room, guess what's going to happen? He's going to come upon you and he's going to be in you and he's going to allow you to testify, the Holy Spirit speaks to them and says what? Go speak in the temple all the words of this life. What life? The life of the kingdom. Okay? Go proclaim the life of the kingdom. Speak the words of this life. I want you to know the Holy Spirit, Jesus even said it. He doesn't speak of himself. He doesn't say what a great person he is. He declares the works of the kingdom, okay? They told him to shut up. They locked him up in prison. But the angel of the Lord, in verse 19, by night opened the prison doors, brought them forth and said, go and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. In other words, what has Christ did in you? What is God doing in you? And what is he going to do in you? He told them to go and proclaim the words of this Christian life. What are the words that God has given you? What is this life that lives in you today? What's God done in your life? What is he doing in your life? And what do you know that he's going to do in your life? You need to begin to proclaim that. You need to begin to speak it. Oh, I don't see it yet, preacher. It doesn't matter if you see it yet. You need to begin to speak it 
Because as you proclaim it by faith, as you decree it by faith, as you decree his word, guess what's going to happen? It's going to begin to manifest and it's going to begin to come to pass. Come on. Speak the words of this life. Amen? <coughs> Excuse me. Speak the words of this life. And then so he gives you the power to testify. Look at that. Look, look at 1 Peter. I won't, I, I, you can turn it. You can write this note down. But 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, To always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies in you. But back up, back up, back up to the A part of that verse. He says what? He says, sanctify the Lord in your heart. What does that mean? That means to set him apart. That means to make him special to you. Okay, when it says this, when you sanctify something, what have you done? You set him apart. You set something apart. We may look at, excuse me. We may look at, we, we may take a bottle of oil that we use to anoint the sick. And we don't go put that on our salads, okay? We don't go put that on food. We have it set apart. We've prayed over it. We've asked God's presence to be upon it. We have set it apart for the work of the Lord, okay? So it is sanctified. So God is saying, ha, huh, watch this. This is revelation here, okay? He is saying, sanctify the Lord in your heart. In other words, set him aside, Set him apart. Set your heart apart. Set your words apart. Set your innermost being apart for the work of the Lord. And he will give you an answer to answer to other people for the hope that lies in you. If somebody came to you right now and they asked you, how come you're not all topsy-turvy about some of, the, some of the world situations going on with this COVID-19 and some of the disruptions in some of our cities. Why aren't you all topsy-turvy wondering and running willy-nilly about what's happening about this? Why, why, how come you're not all upset? Because I've sanctified the Lord God in my heart and he gives me peace which passeth all understanding. He gives me joy unspeakable. Okay, he gives me hope. He gives me a peace. He gives me a word that I can decree and declare to the situation that is at hand. And I can tell it, peace, be still. Violence, cease. Pain, pestilence, you will not come near my dwelling. He gives me a word to speak. And we need to understand that he gives us that word to speak. He gives an answer. For the hope that lies in me. So he gives me the, uh, the power, the ability to testify. And then the next thing it does, that word witness also means to be dead to self. Oh, watch this. This is where I want to really go with this. We're almost finished. I want to drive this point home. Okay, that word witness also is the word martus. It means... What it means is it means to die. The Bible tells us that we need to live a crucified life. That doesn't mean that we lay around dead. Eh, what am I supposed to do? No, no, no. That's not what that means. But that means that I've laid my will aside and I'm only doing what his will wants to do in my life. Let me give you an example here. I'm going to show this to you. And this is, this is, going, to, this is, this is going to be a blessing to you. Turn with me to the book of Acts, the eighth chapter. The book of Acts, chapter number eight. I want you to see something here, okay? Acts chapter eight, beginning at verse 13. Acts chapter eight. And, we, and I, would, I would encourage you to go and read this entire chapter because it's a blessing, okay? And we, we, we understand that persecution came and the way that the, the early the, the way that the early ecclesia responded to persecution was not to cower and hide in a cave someplace, but all that persecution did was thrust the church out into the forefront and put the church out where they needed to go and do the works of the kingdom, not just in Jerusalem. Now they're beginning to go to Judea and to Samaria into the uttermost parts of the earth, okay? That's what persecution did. Persecution caused 
the gospel to be spread. I want you to know some of us need some persecution in our lives. Okay, persecution is our friend. Sometimes you need to get somebody, some things need to happen to you sometime to make you uncomfortable, to get you off your blessed assurance so that you'll begin to do the work of the kingdom. God keeps pushing you. He keeps prodding you. And I got some news for you. If you won't obey, he will stir the nest, so to speak, and make it uncomfortable to where you'll have to get out the nest. Amen. The Bible tells us that we're, we're like eagles and we shall mount up. But you know, a baby eaglet, okay, if, you, if, you, if the mother eagle never began to remove the padding in the nest, that baby eagle would sit right there in that nest and he'd grow up and be a fat eagle. He would die. He would never get out the nest and go out and make his own, okay? And maybe some of the things that we go through sometimes, a lot of times I believe it's God allowing the nest to be made uncomfortable because he wants to stretch you and cause you to go and do exploits for him. Amen? So, Acts chapter 8, verse 13. Watch this. Talking about Simon the sorcerer. Acts chapter 8, verse 13. Okay, we know the story. Philip goes down, he, he goes down to Samaria, and he begins to preach, and he runs across a group of people, and he begins to share the gospel with them. Philip the evangelist. And the Bible says Simon himself, Simon was a sorcerer, in, the, in this particular city, and he was well known. He was considered the spiritual guru of the area, so to speak. Amen? Anybody wanted to know something spiritual, they came to him, and guess what? Of course, they paid him some money, and then he would, do, he'd do, he would call upon his craft, call upon his spirits, and do his thing. Okay? But the Bible says that the evangelist Philip came, and he presented the wonderful words of this life. He presented the gospel. And the Bible says in chapter, in verse 13, then Simon himself believed also. Simon was, was converted. Simon became what we would call today a Christian. And the Bible says he was what? He was baptized, water baptized, not baptized in the Holy Spirit because Philip hadn't taught that yet. But he was what he believed, and he was water baptized. In other words, what happened? Acts, Matthew chapter twenty-eight, verses eighteen to the end. Okay, Philip went forth. He made a believer. He was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, come on. All right, and they and he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. He continued, in other words, now Simon is being taught the word of God. He's learning things. He's hearing. He's being discipled by Philip the Evangelist. And he's seeing these signs and these wonders, okay? And he's like, wow, what's going on here? This guy's doing this stuff, and he's doing it through the power of God, and he's not calling upon all these other sorcerers, so, uh, all, all these other sources, and all these other spirits, and he's not using any of these magic tricks or anything. This is crazy. This is wow. It got his attention. All right. Now, when did the, when the verse fourteen, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Okay. Whom, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. They were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were only water baptized. Now watch what happens. Verse 17. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now how do we know they received the Holy Ghost? Well, we know that an evidence of the Holy Ghost is what? You're going to speak in tongues. So we understand that they begin to manifest, they, they begin to speak in tongues. They begin to... That when the Holy Spirit came upon them as an outward sign of something that happened on the inside, what? They begin to speak in other tongues, okay? So that's an evidence of the Holy Spirit. But watch this. This is where I want us to see. And when Simon, now Simon, it doesn't say Simon received the Holy Spirit. Remember them 380 people who didn't make it to the upper room? Watch this. Simon didn't receive the Holy Spirit. He sat there and he saw what happened. He's a believer. He's water baptized. 
And then he does this. When Simon saw that through the laying on of hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Why do you need the Holy Ghost? Okay, watch what Peter says. But Peter said unto him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Then Peter says this, Repent therefore of your wickedness and pray to God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray ye the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. What happened? Simon's a believer. Simon is water baptized. But he sees a way he can merchandise the gospel. He wants, he, he's, he wants to be recognized. He wants, to be, he wants people to say, hey, you're one of these apostles too. He wants people to say, hey, the power, the power that we saw in you before is still on you. He wants the recognition. And Peter says, no, 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 no. Okay? The Holy Ghost doesn't give man the recognition. But what the Holy Ghost does do is that he gives the man the ability to, to lay his reputation down, to lay his ego down, to lay his past down. It gives us the ability to die and say, Lord, not my will, not my recognition, but your will be done. That's what the power of the Holy Ghost does. Do you see it? Do you see it? Does that make sense to you today? Okay. The Holy Ghost is the one who gives you the power to crucify your flesh. You cannot do it in your own strength. The Holy Ghost is the one who gives you the words to testify. You can't think this stuff up in your own mind. The Holy Ghost is the one who works through you in his power and his authority. You cannot do this gospel work in your own strength. And then the last thing I want to leave you with, leave with you today is that the Holy Ghost gives you power. He gives you ability. He gives you dunamis. Okay? Turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians the 12th chapter. Oh, come on. This is good stuff here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 7. 1 Corinthians 12 beginning at the seventh verse, but the manifestation. What is a manifestation? A manifestation is something that occurs on the inside of you, but it manifests itself on the outside. I'm mentoring a young man, and we've talked about an outward manifestation of an inward change, okay? The reason we are water baptized is because something happened on the inside of me and I've got to let it be shown on the outside. And I do that. I, the, the, the change that, ha that Jesus made in my life is, is shown when I'm water baptized. Okay? I speak in tongues because something happened on the inside of me. And the Holy Ghost has got to man himself, manifest himself outwardly in my life. And the way he, one of the ways he manifests himself is how? Through speaking in other tongues. Okay, it's a gift for today. And I challenge you, let me just take a sidebar here, okay? I, see, I, I can see Pastor James, he's sitting over there in his, in his recliner right now trying to reel me back in. But I'm going to go off on a tangent here for a second. You need to use your prayer language on a daily basis. Not when you feel goosebumps and you feel the hair rise up on the back of your head or you get emotional. You need to use your prayer language. I like what Paul says, that I speak in tongues more than you all. Okay? And I will, I will confess this. I do very little praying in English, okay? I do most of my praying in tongues. Uh, why do I do that? Because of the simple fact I know when I'm praying in tongues, number one, the devil can't understand a thing I'm saying. 
Number two, it's direct communication between me and my heavenly father. Number three, I realize that when I pray in tongues, according to Jude verse 20, that I am praying and I'm building up my most holy faith. So that tells me that when I'm praying in tongues, I'm praying the pure, unadulterated word of God concerning the situation the Holy Spirit has placed on my heart. I know I'm praying the word, okay? And I know that the word is what changes things, okay? Because I understand that I can't do this in my, on my own strength. I can't do this on my own. I've got to have the Holy Ghost. And he's the one who works in me, through me, and with me to do the work of the kingdom. Oh, let's come on. I'm reeling myself back in. 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, if you're going to be if you're going to call yourself Pentecostal, if you're going to call yourself spirit-filled, if you're going to call yourself charismatic, then there needs to be some gifts manifesting in your life. He says he gives you power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Acts, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts, plural, of healings, and that should be plural also, in the original Greek it is, there are different manifestations of how people are healed. Sometimes, sometimes people are healed by receiving the word. Sometimes people are healed by the laying on of hands. Sometimes people are healed by somebody's shadow passing by them. Sometimes people are healed by cloths, prayer cloths. Sometimes people are healed by listening to a radio broadcast. Sometimes people are healed by reading scripture. There are many manifestations. Don't box God in, okay? To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse types of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. But watch what it says. But these all worketh that one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Ha, 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 ha. You don't get to go pick what gift you decide you want. You can desire a gift, but at the end of the day, he gives the gifts as he will. I remember a lady that I used to know. She wanted to flow in the gift of, of she wanted to, to, to be able to interpret tongues and give prophecy in church. And God would never allow her to do that. But she, uh, she, she could look at you and healing would manifest. But eventually she got to the place where she, because she wouldn't flow in the gift that God gave her, that gift of healing stopped manifesting itself also. Okay, let me tell you something. It goes back to having the Holy Ghost allowing you, who makes you vulnerable and makes you to surrender. That's the reason. 380 didn't make it. 120 made it to the upper room. And those 120 changed the world. Why? Because they obeyed and then the Holy Spirit came and they testified and they allowed the power of God to flow through them. So that's, at, that's 1 Corinthians 12. Oh, but wait, let, let me just run something else past you because many, and I love to do this. Go with me to Romans chapter 12. See, we all know about these gifts. Okay, but none of us really talk about Romans chapter 12, and I cannot talk about, I can't mention the gifts unless I also mention Romans 12. Look at Romans 12, verse 4. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. Okay, for as we have many members in one body, and all not, not all members have the same office. For we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. In other words, we are stuck with each other. We got to work together. Our gifts have to complement each other, but not just the gifts in, in 1 Corinthians 12, but look at this. Having then therefore in verse 6, gifts different, differing, differ, having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, 
Well, the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. That word ministry is actually serving, okay? Or he that teaches on teaching. Or he that exhorts on exhortation. He that gives all. See, giving's a gift, okay? Now, all of us give. All of us are called to give, okay? But there are some people, that's your gift. God funnels money into your hands so that you can be a, re a financial resource to the kingdom of God. Amen. And guess what? He, does, he, may, he always makes sure that your needs are met. That's not just the one who tithes and one who gives on a weekend, okay, or through the week. The gift, the gift of giving is a specific gift that God blesses people in the church with. Okay, let him do it with simplicity. He that rules or the gift of governing, they do it with diligence. He that shows mercy, they do it with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. So in my, clue, in my closing, as I conclude this, what is the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Is it just tongues? No. Is it just agape? That's a big part of it. Okay? But the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in your life is that, number one, you are obedient. Number two, you have something to say concerning the things of the kingdom. And number three, you are dead to yourself. You've allowed God to come in and point out and put his finger on areas in your life. And he says, James, I, you don't need that. I want to take it away. Meg, you don't need that. I want to take it away. Lilia, you don't need that. I want to take it away. He puts his finger on things in our lives. And we say, Lord, I surrender. Crucify me in that area so that I can be resurrected to walk in the newness of life. Understand this. There is no crucifixion without a resurrection. He always brings us to a higher level once we allow him to crucify something in this body that we don't need. Amen? That's the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's the evidence of Pentecost and Ecclesia that is completely surrendered to his will, to those who want to do. They, the only thing in their life is, is their desire to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, because we know, we know, we know that all these other things are going to be added unto us. Amen. Can we pray today? Ha, huh. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your joy. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for the power that lives in us, that rests upon us, and that flows out of us because we're surrendered to you and we are your vessels. We thank you for it. And we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Say amen. Say amen with me. Amen, amen, amen. Ha, we love you guys. Be blessed. Don't forget Apostle Barbara this, this Tuesday, this Thursday, and this Friday. It's going to be a fire time. Come on. Amen. We're counting the days. We are praying for when we can gather, gather together in person again. We know it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Just waiting for it to manifest. We love you guys. Be blessed. We'll see y'all during the week. Keep us in prayer. We're praying for you. And we're excited about the work that God is doing in our lives. Okay, these are exciting times. And we're excited about what God is doing in your lives. Amen. We love y'all. Be blessed. And we will see you soon. Bye-bye.